cherubim and seraphim falling down before him. Open up your Bible with me to Isaiah chapter 6. While you're doing that, I want to show you what I, uh, I confiscated from one of the tables in the, in the facilities. It's a ceramic cherub. And you kind of look at this, and it's a, it's a child, probably seven or eight years old, with hands folded and head turned peacefully in prayer, contemplating. Wings like an angel. We say angels have wings, but truly in the Bible, the angels don't have wings. They're never described as having wings. Now, cherubim and seraphim have wings, but angels don't. So this would be considered a cherub, what we would call a cherub. But I want you to get this out of your head. Because this is nothing like what the Bible describes cherubs to be. We think chubby little babies with wings, right? Something that might look like an angel. I remember my grandmother had all kinds of angels and cherubs all over a shelf. She just liked to collect them, the little ceramic figures. Well, the Bible teaches us something completely different whenever it comes to cherubim and seraphim. Imagine enormous creatures with wings, with eyes that look like animals, but not quite like animals, look like more than animals. Majestic, wonderful, amazing, even fearful to look at them. Well, when Isaiah sees these cherubs, these seraphs as they're called in the Scripture, he's fearful for his own life. He realizes that he is standing on holy ground. And so I've entitled the message, Holy Ground. Would you stand with me? Let's read about Isaiah's vision. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two He covered His face, with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, Holy Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of Him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. Lord, we thank You that Your Word was on Isaiah's lips. And that he shared faithfully the Word that You had given him. And now, Lord, I pray that Your Word would be upon my lips. And that I would be able to share faithfully the words that You have given me to say. And Lord, I pray that every person that hears would not leave from this place changed, unchanged. But they would leave changed for Your glory. And Lord, that You would... Do your work among us. We would be faithful to you, Lord. And we'll give you the credit and the glory for all that you do. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. I want to share with you this biblical truth this morning as we look at this text. And we think about cherubim and seraphim. And we think about Isaiah's vision. Here's the truth. You must become holy in order to stand upon holy ground. Jesus said you must be perfect Therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that's a 
difficult truth to deal with because we would look at our own selves and we'd say, not me. I'm not holy. Well, Isaiah has this vision. And he enters into the holy presence of God. And when we say that word holy, the word holy simply means set apart or different. Not like us. Because God is the one who is holy, and we are not. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all gone our own way. We've rebelled against God. None of us are righteous. No, not one. Not a single one of us. But let me ask you this. Have you ever entered into the holy presence of God? You ever been there? Ever been in, so enveloped by the, the holy presence of God that all the hairs on the back of your neck are, are standing at attention in reverence to the holiness of God? Have you ever been there? Well, I've been there too, and I and I've, I've found myself in that place, and I feel a little bit like Isaiah. I feel like I shouldn't be here. I, should, I don't deserve to be in the presence of Almighty God. So if you've experienced that, and I've experienced that, and Isaiah has experienced that, we must ask ourselves how. Because the Bible teaches us that you must become holy in order to stand upon holy ground. How do we become holy? Well, I want us to look at Isaiah's vision and kind of unpack this. First, Isaiah's vision was about a holy place. A holy place. We find out that his vision brings, ushers him into the temple he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, well, that year marked a period of transition in the lives of the people of Judah, God's people, where, to whom Isaiah prophesied, both for and against. Isaiah was prophesying under the rule of King Uzziah, and during that time, it, it, it was a, a period of relative peace, lack of war. Mostly prosperous in the land. But then later on, it's going to take a shift and turn. And Isaiah is going to prophesy against the people of Judah. But it's going to go from peace to war. From prosperity to famine. And into exile. And when Isaiah saw the Lord, he had a spiritual vision that prepared him to be able to prophesy during that difficult time. The Bible says he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. So he's in the throne room of God. He's in the temple. The Bible says high and lifted up. And amen, that's the way our God sits. High and lifted up. So far as the heavens are above the earth, are God's ways above our ways. He's high and lifted up. Moses had a similar experience whenever he went high up on Mount Sinai and the Lord told him to take off his, uh, the sandals off of his feet. Don't take his feet off. Take his sandals off of his feet because the place where he was standing was holy ground. Isaiah was on holy ground. And then the Bible tells us that the train of his robe filled the temple. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But look at verse 2. Above him stood the seraphim. Now, the word seraphim means fiery serpent. Or the word is also related to burning or shining or, or glorious. And we think about these animals, and, or not animals, but creatures. And they are magnificent. They shine, they glow. And then the word also means to be noble. So there's a little bit of a duality to that, to the name seraphim, to be noble. So they're noble ones. They're shining, they're glowing, they're fiery serpents. And then another word that's used, and Ezekiel has sort of the same vision, and he calls them cherubim. And we see this word throughout the Scripture. Seraphim really only occurs here in Isaiah. But we see the word cherubim all throughout Scripture. So we realize that, okay, well these are prob probably seraphim. And the word cherubim possibly means intercessor or one who prays. I'm really thankful for that, that they pray to God because I'm sure that they're praying on our behalf. They're interceding for us. Cherubim and seraphim guard the entrance way into the holy place. 
The first time they're mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis 3 and verse 24. And we see that the Bible says that after Adam and Eve sinned and God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden, away from the tree of life and also away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and all of the blessings of the garden, the Bible says that God placed a cherubim there and a flaming sword that went in every direction to keep them, to guard them out of the garden. Away from the tree of life. And so they're guarding the holy place. Cherubim stand at the boundary between heaven and earth. Our space and God's space. And they stand there to guard. So that you know that you're about to enter into holy place, holy territory. To a holy space. And this is exactly the symbolic role that they played in the temple and in the tabernacle. Symbolic cherubim were placed all over Israel's tabernacle and temple. All over. And we see pictures and images of the tabernacle and we forget that there's cherubim all over. And they were miniature representations of what God had done in the Garden of Eden. Those tabernacle, the tabernacle and the temple. The holy space of God. Cherubim were embroidered into the curtains of the tabernacle in Exodus 26. And on the veil that marked off the holy of holies. Moreover, he says... You shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twine linen and blue and purple scarlet yarns. You shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. God commanded that they would do this. Now this is amazing. Two cherubim were sculpted of pure gold and placed on the Ark of the Covenant. And they overshadowed, their wings overshadowed the mercy seat. This was the, the focus spot of the presence of God in the tabernacle. And later on, whenever the Ark of the Covenant goes in to the holy place that Solomon had created and dedicated to the Lord called the temple, which was a bigger building which basically represented the tabernacle, had all the same dimensions, just larger as the, uh, as the tabernacle did. Solomon created 18 foot tall cherubim to stand in the holy place. I mean, you, can you imagine 18 feet? I know Craig's up there. I know he's measured this a thousand times, but is that close, Brother Craig, to the height of the ceiling right up here? Close? As tall as a ceiling in the holy of holies, cherubim. Why? They were standing guard. Letting us know that this is holy space. Cherubim were engraved all over the wall of the temple. 1 Kings chapter 6. Exodus 25 and verse 22. God says to the people, says to Moses, There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. What they represented is that God can create anything that He wants to create. And His creation is awesome and amazing. But on the other hand, God is holy and you can't go in and see God. First hmm. Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. So the people went to Shiloh and brought from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord. The Lord of hosts who is enthroned above the cherubim. And also later in 2 Samuel. The Lord of hosts who sits enthroned above the cherubim. Psalm 90. 9 and verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The holiness of God is demonstrated by the cherubim and the seraphim. And so Isaiah says, each had six wings. With two he covered his face. Why does the cherubim do that? Even the cherub will not look at God. At the holiness of Almighty God. And not only that, He's covering Himself up. Now, 
I'm just going to go into this for just a second now. It's a side note, but I want you to pay attention, okay? He's covering his feet, but in the Bible, there's not a different word for feet in the Old Testament as the rest of the lower parts of you. You following? He's covering his face, and he's covering his lower parts. He's reverencing himself before a holy God. If these creatures whom God created and they've known no sin and they've only ever been in the presence of God magnify the holiness of God, how much more should we, a broken and unholy people? Well, that was the idea that Isaiah had in his mind when he saw this wonderful sight, this wonderful vision. And he realized that not only was he in a holy place, he was in the midst of a holy presence. Because the place where Isaiah was, where he was standing, was only holy because of the Holy One seated upon the throne. It wasn't holy because of the seraphim. It wasn't holy because of all of the the fixtures in the temple. It wasn't holy because Isaiah was there. It was holy because the Lord was there. Because He was present. And if you go on and you look and you see about the presence of the Lord, it talks about how uh, the Lord uh, was in that place and high and lifted up and the train of His robe, verse 1, filled the temple. The word train really is the Hebrew word, the hem of His robe. It's talking specifically about the the lower part of His robe, just the hem. You got hems on your blue jeans? On your slacks, just that bottom part filled up the temple. The robe itself represents the royalty, the majesty of Almighty God. The temple itself could not contain the presence and the holiness of God. Holy presence. Psalm 93 and verse 1, The Lord reigns, He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as His belt. Yes, the world is established and it shall never be moved. Psalm 104 and verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O O Lord my God, You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. And so the seraphim call to one another in antiphony. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies is what that word means. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And they're calling to one another. And when they call to one another, the Bible says, as they do that in verse 4, the thresholds shook at the voice of Him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. The Bible doesn't say that the wall shook. You get that? It doesn't say that the stones of the threshold shook. Did you hear that? What does it say shook? The foundations of the threshold shook. You know, if you do your research, you study and you find out, they've undercut, they've uh, uncovered these stones in Israel, and some of these stones are four feet thick, Eight feet tall and 30 feet long. You you want me to repeat that? Four feet thick, eight feet tall, and 30 feet long, solid granite. When they quarried these stones, and, and to date, of all stone buildings, These are the largest hewn stones ever known to mankind in a building. They estimate that the largest one weighs about 570 tons. And when the seraphim called on one another, that rock began to rattle. We think about what 
the Lord says, Psalm 9, 19, verse 1, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. The whole earth is full of His glory. And whenever His glory and His holiness is proclaimed, the earth shakes. And then the Bible says the house was filled with smoke. The smoke was always accompanying the theophany of God. That means the, the coming of God, the presence of God on the mountain of God. And also in Ezekiel chapter 10, whenever Ezekiel has a similar vision of the throne room of God, the whole place is filled with fire and smoke. And all of this, the seraphim are simply the worship leaders in the room. And they're pointing to the one who's on the throne. Simply declaring who He is. Let me make this point. You've missed the point of worship if when you leave this place, you go out and you talk about how good the music was. How wonderful the preaching was. How beautiful the building is. How comfortable the pews are. You've missed the point. If you go out and you fail to speak about the holiness of God. It was a holy place. There was a holy presence. Thirdly, holy people. Now Isaiah, as he enters into this place, is representing a nation of people. He's representing the Jews. The tribe of Judah. And so, as he sees this in verse 5, he says, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah's response is probably exactly the response that every one of us would have. He was immediately struck by the awesomeness and the holiness and the presence of God in that place, and then immediately convicted about his own sinfulness. And he realized, I shouldn't be there. Psalm 24, David says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. So, just breaking that down for just a minute. Clean hands, a pure heart, and lips that tell the truth. In the presence of God. That's who can stand in the presence of God. Isaiah just starts with his lips and he says, You know what? I'm a liar. I have unclean lips. I say things I shouldn't say. Man, if we just look at the Ten Commandments and we start going down the list and we say, Okay, well, I've done that. I'm okay there. I'm okay there. I haven't killed anybody. Will you get to where it says, And not bear false witness? Not tell a lie? We all go, Oh, got me. If he hadn't already been gotten. And truly, every one of these. Not only did Isaiah have unclean lips, the Bible says that out of the overflow, Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So there was uncleanness in his heart. He didn't have a pure heart. And so because he didn't have a pure heart, he didn't have clean lips. And if he didn't have clean, a clean heart, he didn't have clean hands either. Because the things that he did were, was wrong. So, is he qualified or disqualified? Just, just thinking about this, I'm just going to say, is he qualified? You say yes or no, okay? Was Isaiah qualified to be in the presence of God? Yes or no? No. And he knew it. And neither are you. You don't deserve to be in the presence of God. In fact... This word, woe, we use it, you know, you ever ride, ridden a horse? 
whoa, horsey. And that's what we think, whoa, is. whoa, slow down. No, that's not what the Bible word means, whoa. The Bible means a little bit, something a little bit different than wait, slow down. The Bible means I'm ruined. I think about what Abigail, you know, her vocabulary is starting to grow a little bit. She's gotten to where she'll come up to me and pinch my legs and pull my hair on my legs and say, ow. <laughs> and then I'll say, ow. <laughs> That's right. But she's got another word that she likes to use. It's actually two words, I guess. I don't know. She, it's in her playpen. I call it baby jail because she can't get out. And she knows she can't get out, but she protests that she's in baby jail by taking all of her toys and throwing them out. And then whenever they hit the floor, she says, uh-oh. So this word, woe, it's a lot like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh. You fill in the blank, I'm not going to say it. That's what Isaiah is saying. I shouldn't be here. He was honest about his own sinfulness before God. And because of that confession, in response to that confession, verse 6, then one of the seraphim flew to me having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Notice that's the exact place where Isaiah admitted that he was sinful. And that the people around him were sinful. It was right at the lips. The prophet of God admitting his sinfulness. The one who speaks for God saying, I'm not worthy to speak. Now, the Bible says the Lord took that coal and touched his lips. And he was made clean. He says, it has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. And in that moment, he became holy. The question that we have in Isaiah's vision is, if this is related to the temple, and it's related to the sacrificial system of Israel, because clearly it is, and there's an altar that's there, the Bible talks about the brazen altar that's there in the temple. And it's the place where the priest would go in on the day of atonement. Atonement means to make one with God, make peace with God, have your sins covered. You can think about the word atonement this way, at one meant. God makes us one with Him. At one with God. At one meant. And so, you think about it that way, and all of those things took place on the Day of Atonement where the priest would take in the offering, burn it on the brazen altar, and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And then he would go out and he would sprinkle the blood on the people of Israel of the sacrifice. When we look at Isaiah's vision, it seems like something's missing. The altar's there. The hot coals are there. Everything is where it should be in the temple. Even the Lord is there. But then the question is, and Isaiah is there and he shouldn't be there. But something's missing. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the animal that should have been on the altar? And the answer to the question is, in that moment, the Lord is declaring that He Himself is the sacrifice. He took our place so that an unholy people could become holy. He sent His one and only Son. He Himself bore our sins and our transgressions. They laid Him on the cross, nailed Him to the cross, lifted Him up above the earth, and He bled and He died 
on that hill to make atonement for you and me. So that we could enter into the presence of a holy God. Can you see how much God loves you? Can you see this wonderful thing that He did for you? No, you're not worthy. And you'll never be on your own. But you have been made holy. Peter says we are a chosen race, a holy priesthood. But then he goes on to tell us that we've been called out of darkness into His marvelous light that we might what? Proclaim the excellencies of the One who called us. So you see a holy place, a holy presence, But Isaiah's vision is also about a holy people because he's made holy in that moment by the sacrifice of Almighty God. But then lastly, a holy purpose. He has a holy purpose. Look at what it says in verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, what? Here I am, send me. It's not enough for you to say, yes, I believe in the Lord. And yes, I trust Him to save me. You're not truly, truly believing in the Lord until you're ready to say, here I am. Send me. Make Him the Lord. He is seated on the throne. He is high and lifted up. And He has chosen you and me just like He chose Isaiah To become His instrument of this wonderful, wonderful grace that He offers. Hebrews, the writer tells us, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then Paul tells us in verse 12 of Ephesians 3 that we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. We can enter into the presence of God. But the most wonderful thing about it all is because of what God did, His presence enters into us. And His Holy Spirit goes with us. Manly Beasley said, A glimpse of God will save you. To gaze at Him will sanctify you. Jesus brings us into His presence to save us and to sanctify us, to set us apart, to make us holy, so that we can go out and we can spread the good news of Him wherever we go. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? And what Paul is doing in the moment is he's kind of getting on to these 1 Corinthians Christians. And he's saying, you know what? You're not acting like you know God. You're not acting like you know Jesus. And your witness to the world is at stake because you're not behaving the way God would have you behave. So he says, you not know that you're... Body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. In other words, live for Him. So let me ask you again. Have you ever been in the presence of God? Maybe it was at church somewhere. Maybe it was today. At Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, you were worshiping with us and you knew the presence of Almighty God. And when we sang, Holy, 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 your heart was quaking inside of you and your hairs were standing at attention. Or maybe you were on a high mountain somewhere and you were just enjoying the beauty of God's creation and God tapped you on the shoulder and said, Here I am. And you experienced the presence of God. Maybe the day that you entered into those cold waters of the baptistry. Maybe they were warm whenever you did that. They were cold whenever I did because I got baptized in January and there was no heater. Or they forgot to turn it on or something. But you entered those cold waters. And when you came back up, 
the presence of God just rushed on you. And you knew Him. Have you ever been there? If you know that, you need to admit right now that you don't deserve it. I don't deserve that. Woe is me for I'm undone. Because I've entered into the presence of Almighty God. Then you need to realize it's only because of His blood. That the blood of Jesus was offered. And He enters into the holy place for us on our behalf with His sacrifice. Now, have you trusted in Him? I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe you're saying today, Pastor Josh, I really don't know that. I don't, I don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't know what it's like to be in God's presence. I want to be, but I don't really know what that's like. Well, if that's you, the Lord Jesus is saying today that He is willing, ready, and able to receive you in. He'll make you holy today. He'll forgive you of your sin. He'll make full atonement for that. So that not only can you enter into His presence today, you'll never ever have to leave. You can be there forever, for eternity. He wants that for you. If you're willing... And you're ready. Then pray this prayer with me. With every head bowed, every eye closed. Just say this to the Lord. Lord Jesus. I admit to you that I am a sinner. I'm just like Isaiah. I don't deserve to be in your presence. And I deserve the penalty for my sin. But Lord Jesus, I believe that you yourself are my sacrifice. You died on the cross for me. And you rose again on the third day. So I ask you to forgive me. I place my faith and my trust in you. And I'll live the rest of my life loving you and living for you. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're about to have our invitation. This invitation is for you. If you're trusting the Lord Jesus for the very first time to save you, to forgive you from your sins, we want to know so we can celebrate with you about that. So you come as we sing. If you're looking for a church family, a church home where you can serve and worship the Lord, you know Jesus, you love Him with all your heart, but you want to have a church family well, Myrtle Grove Baptist Church is willing to welcome you here to be a part of the family of faith. And so you come during the invitation. If you need prayer, if you want to bring your heart before the Lord and say, Lord, I've not been living for you. I have not been telling others about how wonderful you are and about your mercy and grace. And I want to do that. I want to be faithful to you. And I don't want to live my life according to my own will, but I want to live according to yours. And you want to come and have prayer. We're here to receive you. You come. As we sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me all again? Nothing but the
seat. We have an exciting opportunity to, coming up ahead of us, to kickstart back up uh, a ministry that had kind of had a pause for a moment uh, with everything that was going on, in that we get to uh, bring back Upward Sports. Um, yeah, uh, it is a super exciting opportunity. I don't know necessarily if you guys know how impactful Upward can be but it is one of the best opportunities we have to uh, reach the community, uh, engage the community, and, and really show a lot of children um, just not only the gospel, but how to have uh, fun and fellowship and, and to really get started in what, you know, a lot of students get their start uh, and their love for sports from Upward Ministry. And so I've talked to high school soccer players uh, that I coach, and the first soccer team they were ever on was an upward soccer team. I've talked to, you know, basketball players, and the first, you know, place that they actually played was in a church gym. Uh, and then they went on to play for, you know, all of middle school and all of high school, and it took up seven years of life, but they got a love of the sport um, in, in up, through upward. Uh, and we get the opportunity to not only, like, you know, help students find a love for sports, but to present the gospel every step of the way. Uh, at practices, at games, um, you know, through, uh, through playing, through sportsmanship, through leadership uh, in, in terms of what the Bible says and praying before games and praying after. And so uh, we get to bring that back. We weren't able to do it for a while just uh, due to different reasons. And so it's so exciting that we get to bring that back. We're also going to be back upward cheer that goes right alongside it. And so we're bringing back both upward basketball and upward cheer uh, that will start a little bit later in the year. Uh, but a lot of planning goes into it, a lot of getting volunteers, a lot of setting up schedules and all of that. And so we're going to start meeting about it today. So right after the service in uh, the fellowship hall, um, just immediately after service, if you head straight there, we'll have people there in the fellowship hall. We'll be having a meeting um, discussing just the, the starting information, um, getting uh, uh, 
you know, the information of, you know, this is what's going to be happening, when it's going to be happening, you know, tentative schedules and things like that to everybody who's interested. So if you're interested in volunteering at any point with Upward, uh, whether it's to coach, whether it's to ref, whether it's to run concessions, whatever it may be, um, we ask you to, to come join us. Uh, we would love to get your input. We'd love to, to get you started on that, that process. Um, but uh, this is an exciting opportunity. We've had um, such a great summer when it came to children's ministry, through children's camps, through children's VBS. Uh, lives have been changed. Uh, students have, uh, children have accepted um, the gospel, have decided to follow Jesus, got baptized, and that is so exciting. And we just want to continue to be there for them in every step of the way, in discipleship and fellowship. And so that starts right after uh, this service. Uh, tonight also, um, starting, I think the actual event starts at 6.30, um, but there's going to be a little bit of music before and fellowship beforehand. Um, so if you want to get a little early, I think w uh, one of the bands is going to start playing some songs around 6.20. Um, uh, just a mixture of, of uh, our band here and, and Calvary's band. Um, so we'd love to have you join us. We're going to be doing a unity movement uh, event, um, kind of led by uh, Ron Lentini but, and his ministry, um, but just all the churches in the area coming together and realizing what's important, that's the gospel. And so we'd love to have you join us in that time of worship and fellowship and prayer uh, and in unity. Um, and so that starts real, really around 620, uh, and that is right here in the sanctuary. So we'd love to have you join us. Um, now, uh, I get the, the pleasure of bringing up Miss Kathy. Um, she's just going to talk to you a little bit about evangelism uh, and just some exciting opportunities that we have here at Myrtle Grove uh, and just sharing the gospel with our community. Well, Pastor, based on the music this morning and the word I heard, we are a people of unclean lips, but once redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are commanded to go into the world and spread the gospel. And we have come up with a, um, we've done this before here at Myrtle Grove, so please get involved in this. If you're concerned about your lost neighbors, friends, and family, it's turning everyday conversations into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so, I'll have a sign-up board out there in the foyer, and this is something we need to get busy on in these days. Thank you. Uh, we now have a video to show for uh, some uh, other exciting opportunities through Operation Christmas Travel. The kids are playing, are laughing, joyful. It's like a whole world to them. Because for the first time, they have received this precious gift. Operation Christmas Child gives our church an opportunity to touch the world. It's a great adventure to evangelize. You've got an army of volunteers that pack the boxes that are helping OCC to take the gospel literally to millions of children. This is the good Samaritan work that the Lord is looking for people to do. Getting people locally to think globally. What I love about OCC is that they are intentional about pouring into the lives of kids. They receive a box and also an invitation to come back and learn more about Christ. We just don't want to just hand out a box and stop there. We want them to grow in their faith. It's a great tool, an effective tool to reach communities with the gospel of Jesus. It's exciting to get people to heaven, but it's also exciting to get heaven to people. I want to ask Ms. Francis to come up here for just a minute. Give her a mic. So I asked her to come up and share with us a little bit about Operation Christmas Child. So the first thing is just tell us a little bit about what Operation Christmas Child is all about. It is an opportunity for you to become a missionary. I cannot go to South America or to India 
and be a missionary, but I can send a box. And these boxes are, um, go for the Samaritan's Purse sends these boxes to, child, to children that are in need, and they are able to tell about Jesus through the booklet called The Greatest Gift. And it is printed in their native language. So our church is participating in this. Uh, so tell us about what goes into the box. Uh, you just told us about the, the gospel track that goes in there, the booklet that goes in there. What else goes in there? Okay. We put school supplies. You can put small uh, toys. And you can do hygiene products like... Um, so face cloths, toothbrushes, no toothpaste, and uh, you can put T-shirts, socks, and like a musical instrument, like a uh, harmonica, or um, uh, a guitar. Yeah, a small <laughs> guitar. Oh, okay. A play guitar. A flute or something. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, and. Um, you can put Mardi Gras beads if you have them. Mardi Gras beads? Yeah, okay. Mardi Gras beads. So, uh, Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I can hold that for you. Um, we have asked the children's department to fill out blank cards like these um, to put in each box. They're just going to put a little note to the children and put them in each box. So if you have any of these blank cards that you get in the mail sometimes, you can bring them up here and put them in the OCC box in the office. That's great. That's a, that's a wonderful idea. Yeah. So uh, there's a list of do's and don'ts about what to put in the box somewhere, isn't there? Yeah. Where can we find that? Okay. Is that there is a list out in the foyer. And there's one of these boxes that's right in, behind it. And if you want to do it, just contribute items, you can pick up one of those boxes, I mean, one of those lists. Or if the office has these boxes and um, there is a list and a brochure like this in each box. And on the back of the brochure is tells whether you're going to be doing a boy or girl and what age you are uh, filling the box for. And um, they ask you to please oops, put the label on this box so they will know where to send these boxes to or what, I mean, what age group to give to these children. Okay, so do I have to pay for the shipping no, for the box? No, no. Uh, VBS collected enough money this year during their during VBS time that they would cover the shipping costs this year. Amen. And the shipping, right? <laughs> and the shipping cost includes the shipping of uh, these boxes from like Atlanta to the country they're going to, but they also pay for the materials that are used in over there, like the greatest gift, and some, some of them even get a New Testament in their native language. So can I just pay for, can I just send some money if I don't want to pack a box and I don't want to go shopping or anything, can I just send money? You can either send money to the Samar to uh, Samaritan's Purse, or you can give money, and um, we will go out and fill a box for you. Or and anyway, the more you know, if we get a, even a dollar, and then somebody else's dollar can add up and make a box, but you will be missing the opportunity to participate in this ministry. If you just give money. <laughs> all right, well, then there's two questions then. Is there a deadline, first of all? And then are we going to pack boxes as a church? All right. The, um, if you're giving items, 
The deadline is September the 30th. That'll give us a month to pack the boxes. Okay. And if you're giving a box, the deadline is October the 31st. Okay, so if I pack it up and I have it all ready, I need to have it in by October 31st. Right, okay. but all if right. you're just giving items. Um, all right. That's our good. Sunday school class has, a packing, has had packing parties in the past um, right now, we don't have enough money to, I mean, enough items to have a party, but I'm hoping to get more. All right. All right. And That's why we have you up here. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, and like I said, what goes in the boxes, there is uh, uh, paper outside, out in the foyer. And, um, but whether you pack a box, or give an item, we need, we need to pray for you. You need to pray for your box, for that, it, whether it be a boy or girl, um, and um, pray that their hearts will be open to the love of Christ and that many will, be, will, come, will come to faith in Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Francis. And, I mean, you just, you just imagine with me for a second. In, in October, late October, early November, us having all of this area here and all of that area over there filled up with shoe boxes that are filled and ready to go to other parts of the world for these children. And then we're gonna, during one of those services, we're going to pray over those boxes. And we're going to pray that the gospel would change hearts and lives in Places that we could never go, but that a shoebox is going to find itself. All right, well, let's pray about that right now, and we'll close out our service. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all the wonderful opportunities that you give us to be a witness for you. And as members of Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, we know your presence. You've been here today. We've met with you today. Remind us, remind us all of our responsibility to go out and let the good news of Jesus Christ be on our lips. Demonstrate to the world that we know the Lord Jesus by the way that we live. So that we may see lives change for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Alright, God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Francis.